All right, uh, let's just put a little bit of light down here, like where it says chalkboard lights. That's always a good thing. Let's see, zoom this just a little bit. That screen look all right? Yep, okay, I heard a yep, so I'm going to go with it. Okay, I uh, checked the video out last night. It's pretty good. Ah, it's pretty good. Um, videos, uh, video's good, audio's good. Uh, I checked the settings, and it looks like you might be able to watch it real time if you can't make it to class, but I'll double check that today with the Tegrity people. Uh, let's see, I've also asked just to select a few people in the front that if I forget to move the camera, because I really get into this swoon of teaching and everything, <coughs> and uh, they will tell me to move the camera. So, you know, you don't have to worry about yelling out and raising your hand or storming out of the room if you can't see it on the screen. All right, so hopefully this will make things go just a little bit smoother. All right, any questions so far? You guys know, one second please, you guys know that I, uh, I did push off the deadlines until December, okay, for the uh, Alex stuff. I mean, it doesn't mean put it off to December. Keep working all the time because this is the work that's going to help you get through your exams. But this will take some of that anxiety out of it and also a lot of questions to me about, well, can you reset it and all that. So even though... Uh, you've got until December to finish those assignments, like right before school ends. Uh, p please keep up with it, okay? You'll see the exam dates and, you know, use that as how you should be making your progress. All right, now, there was a question in the back. Yes? It should have been posted after deadline. Did the, uh, did the answers come up after deadline? Okay, well, let me check that out. But I set, I set it so after deadline you should have been able to access it and see what you got. Um, let's see, what else to tell you about that? No, you should be able to view your mistakes too. I had it set so it should have showed you the problems with the responses, but I'll check that out. Okay, we'll get them up. Yeah? What? No. There's, no, I, I, I wrote in the syllabus that I'll be, I'll be dropping three of your lowest quiz grades. So if you missed it, I'm sorry. I always have students who say, well, my computer crashed at a second before the deadline or something. And, yeah, I want to believe everybody, but it's easy for just someone to walk off the street and say, eh, I didn't take the quiz because uh, my computer broke. The bus trip backed over it, you know. It's kind of like I can't do that. So I figured, look, we got about 13 quizzes. We'll drop three of them. So... Your computer can blow up on you, and you can still be looking pretty good for the course. Okay? Hopefully that won't happen. The computer blowing up, I mean. <coughs> Hope you all look good for the course. Okay, any questions? Any questions about material, about the subject matter? We doing okay? Uh, it looks like the stuff's been pretty easy so far. It's kind of re review of the stuff you've already had. But take it seriously. Um, the exams I, I write up, I don't try to, you know people. I don't try to sandbag students, you know, like just kind of like catch you unexpectedly. Uh, I think my exams are very straightforward based on the material that I lecture on. Uh, sometimes I'll tell you to read something and be ready for the test, but I'll give you a heads up on that. I'm not going to play tr games with you guys. But still I get about, without, you know, me looking real close at the scores, I get like 40 to 50 percent failing the exams. Okay? And I think I give a pretty fair exam, so please take it seriously. Uh, keep up with it, okay? You really have to do this, okay? This is a foundation course, and you need it to move on to other stuff. Okay, now that my uh, uh, lecturing, the first part of lecturing is over, uh, let's get back to chemistry. Now, last class, I guess I'm on camera now. Last class, we got into uh, introduction to the periodic table, and what I want to do is just talk a little bit more about that, then move into nomenclature. So the first part of the nomenclature is very simple. You can do it in your sleep. Uh, when we get to the ionic compounds, things get pretty, well, let's say, it, you do get a little, that's where a lot of memorization comes in and also application of rules. So let's get it done, okay? Get out of chapter two and move on. Okay, so uh, periodic table, we have some divisions here. We have metals, okay? Most of the elements on the periodic table are metals. And if you look into your book, oh, by the way, while I remember, I'm sorry, but I'll probably forget before I finish the lecture. Uh, the student who came to me in response to that announcement about uh, sharing lecture notes, please come and see me again. Uh, I, I'm going I'm to confirm that's the person that they say they are. Now, the person who requested this, uh, notify me. You can do it on, on uh, uh, email, black, you know, whatever. Just 
call me or stop by my office, whatever. But I'd like to see both of you guys at separate times. Okay, now back to this. Um, it's all color-coded, okay, the periodic table in the front part of your book. And the metals are either blue or purple, okay? So down here, most of your periodic table are made up of metals, okay? Now, when we talk about metals as far as their properties, anybody give me, how can you tell you got a metal in your hand? Just looking at it, what would you say right off the bat? Shiny. Shiny. Okay, give me something else. Yes? So, is that solid at room temperature? How about mercury? Uh, true, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, but you can still stay here. Okay, give me something else. I hear mumbling. Are there answers in the mumbling? No? Okay. Uh, what? Conducts. Conducts. Conducts what? Electricity. electricity. How about heat? Heat, heat electricity. Let's, I'll put some on the board. How's that sound? That'd be good? Now, I heard shiny, but let's, t let's kick it up a step and say lustrous. Okay, same thing as shiny. It just sounds better. Okay, let's see. We also said that uh, <coughs> conducts, conductive. Okay, that's always good to talk about. All right. Um, what else was said? Dense. Does it have to be dense to be a metal? I mean, it can be dense, relatively, but metals have different densities. Could we say hardness? But, you know, sodium you can cut with a razor blade. And you don't have it to be that strong. What? Pliability, malleable. Malleability. Malleable. That's a good word. Malleable. Okay, that means you can shape it. Okay, how about ductile? That means you can pull it into wires. <coughs> okay, all these things talk about metals. You get a piece of sodium, you know, it's been sitting out. It's going to be all gray and dull because of the oxides and such that form on it. However, you get that razor blade, cut that sodium open, it's just nice and bright and shiny, okay, without those oxides. Okay, so these are the metals, and this is what most of your periodic table is. Now, we also have an area called nonmetals. Okay, now a lot less elements are nonmetals. And on your periodic table in your book, okay, or if you go online and just look at one that's color coded, in this, in this case, they're yellow. They're way over to the far left hand side. Well, let's just say the left hand side. Okay, now as far as properties of nonmetals, the exact opposite of metals. Instead of being lustrous, they're, they're basically dull. Okay, as far as being conductive, they're non conductive. And we'll take these two guys, being malleable and ductile, nonmetals are brittle. Okay, so. When you get over here to the left, right hand side of the periodic table, now you see up here, everything's yellow except for some blue areas. Don't go by that color coding. Go by the one in your book. Okay, that's going to mess you up. By the way, hydrogen, way over there on the far left hand side up on top, non-metal. Okay, that's a non-metal. They put it up there because of the electron configuration. Okay, because of its valence shell configuration. And when we get to that, that's going to explain a lot about how the periodic table falls into place, okay? But hydrogen is a non-metal, okay? In fact, its, elect its electronegativity is right between boron and carbon, not way over here, I mean lower than lithium. All right, so uh, just keep that in mind. Non-metals, right-hand side, okay? Metals, most starting the left-hand side, majority of the periodic table, okay? And, of course, down here, those inner transition metals, we talked about those course of metals also. Now, not going to talk a lot about this, but we also have things called metalloids. Camera, Camera thank you very much. See? Uh, let's see, i got to, oh, here we go, here we go. Oop, I'm wrong, that's just good. Thanks very much, I appreciate that. I was looking at the video, and I could see there was just times I'd get so into teaching that, you saw nothing but what I had written 10 minutes before. Not 10 minutes, but... Okay, these guys are also called semiconductors. Okay. What? What? No, what'd you say? 
Can you guys read metalloids? Yeah. It says metalloids, yeah. If you can't see up there, I've told you to come down here. Or you got it on the screen right there. Okay, semiconductors, they are properties, we'll say, between metals and nonmetals. By the way, if you have a question, could you please raise your hand and I'll get right to you rather than yelling out. It really distractions. All right, so we got this. Uh, as far as the metalloids, if you look in the periodic table, there's like a stair-step fashion of them here. Uh, they're in green, and right here on this table we got one, two, three, four, five, six that are metalloids. Uh, as far as the importance, if you uh, look at, well, you heard about Silicon Valley, well, the business they do, that's all because of semiconductor work, okay? So it might be a very small area, but it's a very, very important area technologically. All right, now I'm giving you all this right now because what I want to do is get into talking about nomenclature of compounds. Okay, we're going to have covalent compounds. Yeah, it should be D there. How's that? Compounds, and we'll have ionic compounds. Okay? Now, before I start the nomenclature, I always like to talk a little bit about the physical difference between covalent compounds and ionic compounds. Okay? Because if you get that understanding down, the nomenclature makes a lot more sense. Otherwise, you're just memorizing stuff blindly. Okay? So, uh... <coughs> Let's talk about covalent compounds first. Where does the name covalent come from? Any idea? Because they share electrons in their bonds, right? Okay, yes, that's very true. If you have like a covalent bond between, let's say, carbon and oxygen, in reality, there are two electrons being equally shared between those two atoms. Now, when I say equally shared, that comes with quotations because we're going to talk about some differences in that concept later. Um, let's see. Yeah, where are the electrons? You guys who remember your chemistry, what is the outermost shell of electrons called? The valence shell of electrons, okay? So think of two atoms that, like the carbon and the oxygen. Now, I'll just draw them the same size. You know, don't worry about that too much. <laughs> and you can imagine them kind of looking like that, okay? The outside of those, those circles represent the outermost shells, the valence shells, okay? Now, think about uh, like two planets. It sounds crazy, but they come together. And instead of when worlds collide, it says when worlds merge. And they come together, and they're... Outermost atmospheres, because you know our atmosphere here is in layers, different, you know, like all that different stratosphere, ionosphere, and all that. Let's say the outermost atmospheres of these uh, two planets just touch and just slightly merge so they can exchange gases. Okay, now those gases, let's say, are helpful to both planets. So what happens is the planets both become more stable, healthier, whatever. Okay, with atoms, it's the same thing. The outermost shell of electrons, the atmospheres, merge and electrons are shared. And that makes things very stable. Let's just say relatively more stable for both of those atoms. Now, I think of it, two valence shells. So covalent, OK? You have two valence shells working together there. It might help you to remember and differentiate between the two types of bonds, OK? So what else can we say about covalent compounds? Let's put this board up and put the other board down. Okay, tech crew, should I move the camera? Yes. There we go. All right, this is exciting. There we go. All right, now a little bit more about this. <laughs> Covalent compounds exist 
as molecules. Okay? Exist as molecules. Okay? When you have ice, you don't have all the all the water molecules don't suddenly you know, like fuse together to give you this continuous like covalent network. Okay, those are individual molecules. That's that's true of any molecular substance. When it goes from like liquid to solid, those molecules stay intact. When it goes from liquid to gas, the molecules exist as discrete entities as they did before. <laughs> so the point is is that they exist as molecules, and we also call them molecular compounds. Okay, same thing. Okay, they're molecular compounds. Okay, now, as far as the nomenclature, let's just say we have a compound here. Uh, let's give you, uh, I'll give you some examples here. CH4, CO2. SO2, oop, let's make that SO2. Methane, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide. Okay, now from what I just told you about metals and nonmetals, what are each of those compounds made up of? Exactly. What we're going to do here is learn how to recognize just from the formula if it's ionic or molecular. That's the first thing, because there are going to be two sets of rules. Okay? So, all covalent. Okay, and I'll say all contain just nonmetals. Okay, they all contain nonmetals. Okay, so you can just look at the form and realize how these uh, basically how to name them. <laughs> okay, now let me show you something. Remember, we talked about. Uh, a law of uh, multiple proportions for compounds. Okay, so let's say when we're reacting to atoms. So let's say we're reacting nitrogen atom, okay, and oxygen atom. Okay, now you're talking to a friend, another chemist. Always assume when you're talking about chemistry, the person you're talking to understands chemistry, okay, and how they react. If you said, yes, I made a, not a nitrogen oxygen compound. They're just going to look at you waiting for more information. Because if you get nitrogen atoms and oxygen atoms and react them, well, you could make this, you could make this, you could make uh, this, you could make this, you could make this, just to name some of them. So you have to be able to differentiate between all the different compounds from those two elements, okay? So <coughs> what we're going to do is, by using prefixes, okay, and I'll give you an example first. This one here is called nitrogen monoxide. Okay? Thank you very much. You guys in the front falling asleep. Nitrogen monoxide. Okay? Now, notice I don't say mononitrogen. There's only two rules here for the covalent compounds. I don't say mononitrogen monoxide, I say nitrogen monoxide. You don't say monocarbon monoxide, you say carbon monoxide. In other words, you never start a name with the prefix mono. That's your first rule. Okay? So never start a name with mono. If there's just one, you just name the element. Okay? Let's do the next one here. Di nitrogen monoxide. Okay? Dinitrogen. So now we know it's mono for one, di for two. Okay? Let's come down here further. N2O. Dinitrogen monoxide. Now again, this is an example here that um, and also the first one, that you can have more than one name for the same compound. There's all kinds of systems. This is just basically a systematic way of doing it, okay? Uh, the first one, NO, it's nitrogen monoxide. It's also uh, uh, called nitric oxide, okay? It's uh, come down here, N2O is dinitrogen monoxide, yes? 
I did? Where? Oh, they're both N2O. Uh... <laughs> Good morning. This is my early morning lecture. Did I tell you that? It's so good we did it twice. <laughs> is this a laughing matter? Yes. Did you know what this is called? Dinitrogen monoxide is nitrous oxide, also laughing gas. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so all is okay now? But yes, I did do it twice. Don't tell anybody. We are secret. Okay? Good. All right. As I said, sometimes I get moving here, but this is okay. What I wanted to do down here, I'll leave it anyway, because like I said, it's so nice, we'll name it twice, as they did with New York, New York. Okay, so uh, with this one here, so they don't have a song for this, do they? I don't know. Uh, laughing gas, okay, let's see. NO2, how's that? Nitrogen, camera, I know, nitrogen dioxide. That's what I thought I was writing there, I get really into fast writing here. This is what happens. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. This guy here. Anybody want to give a shot at this one, N204? Dinitrogen what? Yes, he's got it. He can go home early today. Good. So that's going to be dinitrogen tetroxide. Okay, here's another rule here I'm going to tell you about. Notice here we don't say nitrogen monoxide. Here we don't say dinitrogen oxide. <laughs> okay, the chemist decided, and other scientists, that it sounds silly to talk like that. People won't take you seriously. That's the only thing. It sounds better to say tetroxide and monoxide. So here's the idea. If you have, I guess I'll just put it right here. I hope that's, this fits on there, does it? That's okay, good. Okay, if you have a prefix ending with a vowel and you have the name of the atom beginning with a vowel, you drop the vowel on the end of the prefix. So we don't say tetraoxide, we say tetroxide. Okay? And they do it because it sounds better. Is that right? I think that's the only reason. Okay, there's no law of physics or chemistry that makes them do that, yes. Die? No, not die, no. I know that is a vowel, you got me on that one. You could say dockside, you know, being cool. Hey, man, I'm using dockside. Yeah, dockside. You want to be cool about it, yeah. But no, you say dioxide, you know. That's what they do in Britain, you know. All right, oh yes, what can I do for you? Okay, I was going to get to that right now. Here we go. Well, we're going to learn very shortly. In fact, I'm going to tell you right now. Whenever you see an IDE, that indicates a negative. Let's put that on the board. Okay. Oh, okay, look at this one in just a second. Whenever you see an IDE ending, that indicates negative. Okay. Now, the truth of the matter is, it could be a negative ion you're talking about, like chloride or bromide. It could also mean just an atom that's more negative than another one. When we write these formulas, the more positive atoms come before the more negative ones. You talk a little bit in the book about it. It's not a big deal. It's just when we see electronegativity and how it flows across the periodic table. Also, you've never heard anybody say oxygen carbide or mon monocarbide. Uh, it's always carbon monoxide. Um, the more negative atom always comes second. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit later, okay? But when we see some of these examples, you just kind of pick them up pretty, pretty naturally, almost instinctively. But the IDE, thanks for, I was going to talk about it, but thanks for bringing it up. I, I paid them $5 to say that. Um, IDE will always indicate uh, negative, okay? And even though these aren't ions here, we still use it to indicate the more negative atom. Everybody okay with that? Well, good, I am too. All right, so that is, oh, let me get this last one done here. Di nitrogen, what's, the, what's this one? N205, what would it be? Pent pentoxide, yes. I knew the answer, I was just quizzing you. Okay, 
pentoxide, not pentoxide, pentoxide. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? Okay. Let's walk into, go into the wonderful world of ionic compounds now. Okay. Do you guys need any kind of review on ions? Just uh, what? Why does an atom have a negative charge when it's an ion? What happens? Well, tell you what, let's just do a real quick review on the board. That's 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 what I'm here for. Okay. All right. So if we say uh, first of all, we'll start with just ionic compounds. Okay. <laughs> And just to let you know that there are such things as cations. Okay, and cations are positive ions. Okay, and then we have anions. Anions are negative ions. Okay, let's just talk about your old your garden variety ion. Okay, lithium. Here we go. If we have a lithium atom, bless you, a lithium atom, okay, how many protons, how many electrons do we have in the lithium atom? Right, give me time to get a cup of coffee. We have three. Now, I'm not even going to consider neutrons right now, okay? We just want you to focus on the charges. So in lithium, we have three protons in the nucleus, and... Uh, let me write that here, three protons. Now, for you guys who remember your configurations, and even if you don't, don't worry about it right now, we will have three electrons as such in two separate shells, two in the first shell, one in the third, second shell. We'll get to that oh, much later in the semester. All right, now, you can see here, three pluses, three negatives, we have a total net charge of zero. Now lithium, we will find, loves to lose that one electron to become the lithium ion. Okay? So if you got this down, everybody get this down? First part? Okay, I'll take that as yes. Let's do this now. Let's say lithium ion. Now we have lost one electron, and now we have this where we have three positive charges and only two negative charges. So now when you add them up, we're going to have an overall net charge of plus one. Okay? So, let's see, it's kind of summarizing this. If you have an atom A that has a plus charge, that means that it's lost one electron. Suppose you have it with a plus two charge. That indicates that it's lost two electrons. If you have A with a positive three charge, it's lost three electrons. Also notice that the number comes before the uh, charge sign, the plus or minus. Okay, that's just the convention that they use. Okay, so if I talk about a charge, I'll just say plus one, plus two, but as far as how you note it on the atom, on the ion, it's like this. Okay? Now, with that in mind, let's look at some common charges here. <coughs> okay, these are common charges for ions, especially cations. Okay? If you look at those members of group 1A, okay? So we'll say group 1A. These guys tend to, not tend to, they always lose just one electron and get a positive one charge. Okay, they just do that. That's all, that's the only charge they get. Okay. For group 2A, they always lose two electrons to get a plus two charge. Okay. And then when we talk about group 3A, there's only one guy in there. And that's going to be aluminum with a plus 3 charge. It loses 3 electrons. That's the only one there. Okay? 
Now notice something. All those guys, you have 1A, 2A, 3A, okay? Those guys are all metals, and uh, metals lose electrons. Okay, let's write that down. Metals lose electrons. Let's see, how far am I over here now? Okay, good. Okay, metals lose electrons. So whenever you see, whenever you see a metal, just know it can form cation, cations only. Okay? Now, how do we name these guys? Well, to name cations, this first rule is very simple. In fact, we'll say naming single charge cations. Okay, single charge doesn't mean it's just a plus one. It means there's only one charge, because we'll find out soon that uh, some cations have more than one charge, or rather some atoms can have more than one charge for their ions. Okay, all you do is name the element followed by ion for this, okay? So we'll say name of element plus ion. So when you have Li plus, that's called the lithium ion. You don't say lithium one. You don't say lithium plus one. You just say lithium ion. Okay? If you had Ba2 plus, which is the barium ion, okay? You just say barium ion. You don't say barium two. You don't say barium plus two because um, whenever you're talking about stuff like that, assume you're always talking to a very knowledgeable chemist who knows what things are about. That's, you have to make that assumption. And the idea is you never give that person more information than they need because they get very bored and walk away. If you say barium-2 ion, they say it's too much information. You have to tell me that. Because the chemist knows that barium only forms a plus two. So you just say barium ion. You just say lithium ion, aluminum ion. The ones I just put up here now that I said these are the only charges they form. You do not mention the charge number or you're incorrect. Okay? But just, like I said, just think of it as you don't want to get, you never give more information than you need. You always assume that the person you're talking to or writing this about, whatever, they always know the chemistry. Okay? So these first guys I showed you, you never use a number. Everybody okay with that? All right, let's talk a little more. Is there a question? I thought I heard somebody call me. All right, now, for these first ones, as I said, uh, let me get the camera back here. You don't have to indicate a charge number, that's fine. But if I were to say iron ion, talking to that same chemist, he's going to look at you or she's going to look at you waiting for more information. They're going to wonder uh, which one. Because iron and these transition metals in here can form more than one ion. You can have an iron plus two. You can also have an iron plus three. So here's what you say. You say iron two ion. You write, I might be off the camera right now, just give me a second. You write iron Roman numeral two in parentheses followed by the word ion. Yeah, that's how you write it. Let me move this camera just a little bit further. There we go. <laughs> For this guy down here, the iron plus three, we say iron three ion, and we write iron parentheses three ion. Okay? Is that okay? So in other words, you, you got to tell them. Like that... In that case, you have to give them a little extra information. 
Okay. Now, which guys do this? Well, the transition metals, those are the guys in the center, plus there are main group elements towards the bottom. I'll point out a chart on the book in the book here, that, not a chart, but a figure that shows you the ones. But there's some main group metals we'll talk about a little bit later that also have more than one charge. Okay, they're very easy. You don't have to memorize the charges. By the way, don't worry about memorizing these charges as far as the ones with more than one charge. Okay, uh, memorize the 1As, 2As, 3As. Okay. Uh, print out those periodic tables that are up at your website at the blackboard and use them as uh, for notes. You make notes right on those periodic tables about charges, all kinds of stuff. It's a good way to study it rather than just memorizing, you know, to say it back to me. You know, be able to recognize things in the periodic table. All right, now one more part of this, and this is an older system of nomenclature that I'll put up here for you right now. I think I can fit all this. I'll have to move this over just a little bit. I can't get this off of here. And the reason I'm teaching it to you, this, new, this older system, is because it's still out there. It's still used in some textbooks. Even sometimes when you buy chemical products, it'll be on there. The Fe2, that's the iron 2 ion, it's also called the ferrous ion. Okay, the higher charge is called the ferric ion. The lower charge has an us ending, the higher charge has an ick ending. Okay, now let me go back and give you another example and then I'm going to talk about it just a little bit longer. Okay. Suppose we have SN2+, plus, SN4+. Plus. Okay, this would be tin 2 ion. The bottom one is tin 4 ion. Okay, and that would be uh, tin parentheses 2 ion, tin parentheses IV ion. And as far as the older nomenclature, okay, this one here would be stan us ion. And this one would be stan ik ion. All right. Now I chose the uh, tin and the iron just to kind of show you something here. Let me move this over just a little bit this way now. <laughs> With the older system, well, first of all, iron is called ferrous, ferric. Okay, tin is called stannous, stannic. Because the idea is some of these elements in the periodic table, uh, you can see that the uh, symbol doesn't really match what you call it. Okay, it, because they're based on Latin origins. Okay, that's fine. That's, that's fine. But to do the old system, you'd have to be, you have to remember all the old Latin names. I mean, and there are a bunch of them up there. Plus, look at the difference in charges. Okay, two for the lower charge for this, but here it's a three and a four for the higher charge. If we talk about copper, that's copper one and copper two, not copper two and three or four. <laughs> so the point is that you have to not only memorize and have a working knowledge of all the Latin origins, but you also have to know all the individual charges to basically use these effectively. Now, if you use them all the time, you're a professional chemist or whatever, that's fine. But, you know, for people who are, let's say, not as closely associated to the subject matter, you have, to, you have to agree with me, the newer method is straightforward, it's right there, it tells you everything you have to know. That is 10 and it's got a plus four charge, okay? Now, what are you gonna be responsible for? For an exam, uh, I want you to be able to recognize, when you say us and ik, that you recognize what that stands for. You may not know the charge, but you know that there is, there's a, there's a, that indicates one of two charges, let's say. In fact, some of these transition metals have up to like five and seven different charges, so we're not gonna go there. Take an advanced chemistry course if you wanna do that, okay? But right now, I only hold you responsible for, let's say, iron and tin, okay? 
Uh, just for kicks, hey, just for kicks, I'll put copper up here too. How about that? Okay, you can't you can't go wrong with copper. Okay, so we'll have that's going to be copper one, copper two ion. Okay, so the first one here is going to be cuprous ion. The other one's going to be cupric ion. Okay? So that's the old system. Just recognize it. Know these three because I want to just ask you one exam question on it or something. Okay? But that's what it's about. I'm sorry, what? The first one, group one. What are you saying? Okay, thank you. Cuprus. Okay. C U P R O U S. Cuprus. Can you say that? Okay, you're welcome. All right, we've got just some time here left. Okay, that takes care of the cations. What's that? Well, after we've, no, we've got to finish chapter two before we have a chapter two quiz. Okay, guys, if ever I say, oh, there's an exam coming up on the syllabus and so we're not through all the work, don't sit there and worry about it. Okay, I'm not going to throw an exam at you if we don't have the work done. Okay, so yeah, the quiz will come after we finish and I'll announce it. Okay? So we'll have plenty of time to do this stuff. I'm about a lecture behind right now. My apologies, but that's the speed that I lecture at. Okay, and if people can't see the board, move up, okay? And to some people, they always have to sit in the back there. I don't know why they can't see. And they talk a lot, too. Now, I had a group of people one time. I actually had students. They sat two-thirds of the way back. Listen to that. And uh, they used to talk so loud. I couldn't hear them all the way down here, but people around them actually stopped coming to lecture because they couldn't hear me. So anyway, just want to tell you these things do happen. I try to keep order. It's not funny, <laughs> really. Okay, uh, let's finish up this thing now by talking about anions. Okay, and of course these are negatively charged ions. And we'll be talking about monatomic anions. Monatomic meaning just single atom ions, okay, because we will later get into polyatomic ions. All right, uh, let's see what to tell you about this. Well, first of all, you, uh, as far as the nomenclature, you take the name of element, okay, and what you're going to do is you drop ending and add I-D-E ion. So I'll, I'll get more into this, but to be like chlorine becomes chloride. As I told you before, I-D-E indicates negative. All right, now, I gave you some rules for 1A, 2A, and 3A. Okay, now we're over on the other side of the periodic table where we have nonmetals, and nonmetals gain electrons. Okay, so let's just make a note here, we'll say non-metals gain electrons. All right. Now, first of all, let's go all the way over to the side there where it says zero on the top. We'll call that 8A. Okay. So we'll start with group 8A, which on this periodic table has zero. I don't like doing that, but they do it. Okay, and those are called the noble gases. And I will move the camera in just a second, so no one has to tell me. Oop. Yeah, just, what am I, oh my lord. 
rushing here too much. Noble gases. Does anybody remember why they call them noble gases? They don't react. Why don't they react? Because they're very, very stable. Things react to get more stabilization, more stability, lower energy situations. That's why a lot of chemical reactions occur. Okay, the noble gases, unreactive, okay, because they're very stable. Okay, so no ion formation, okay. They do not form ions. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about 7A, 6A, and 5A. Okay, so start on the right-hand side and start moving inward. We started on the left-hand side before and moved inward. Now, in like accordion fashion, we're going to start on the left-hand side. We have two minutes left, folks. We have start on the left-hand side and move in. Okay? So 7A... These guys form negative one ions, okay? 6A, they form negative two ions. 5A, negative three, but we're gonna lim limit it to just phosphorus and nitrogen. Okay, they'll form negative three ions. So, it goes like positive one, positive two, positive three, negative one, negative two, negative three as you move into the center, okay? And as I said here, they basically form their names. If you have um, oxygen atom, oxygen atom is in 6A, so that'll form a negative 2 charge. It's called oxide ion. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, let's see, let's see. I got a half a minute left. Uh, give me a half a second here. We see a good note to end on here. Oh, yeah. How about this? 4A, no ions. They form covalent compounds. Okay? All right. That is a good place to stop. Okay. See you guys on Friday. Somebody took my pencil here. Okay. Okay. Hang on just one second. I gotta turn this thing off. You need a pencil? No, the stylus. Some person took it. I can't believe.